Very good. So let's begin. Just to say, first of all, a word of welcome. Um, it's very it's very good to see you all here. It's very good to have um, people who I know and people who I don't know uh, share a mutual interest, and that is um, supporting the uh, building awareness around this book, The Yogi's Way. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you for that. Now, I suppose the best way for us to start is just to ground ourselves. Um, some of what I might be talking about will be new for some people. Some of it will be old news, so to speak, for others. Um, but always it's helpful for us just to um, have ourselves in a state of mind where we can receive with an open mind. So if you just want to find yourselves a comfortable position wherever you are, a place where you will be unlikely to be distracted, a place where you will be able to just um, be with yourself and be with your own presence. So just sitting comfortably in your chair or wherever it might be. Keep your feet flat on the ground. Sitting upright with your shoulders back. Take one clean inhalation through your nostrils, using your diaphragm to fill your lungs. And then exhale slowly, 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 relaxing. One more time, one clean inhalation through the nostrils, exhaling slowly. slowly relaxing. And in your seated position, just become aware of your body from toe to waist to head to waist to toe. Take note of your body. Appreciate the space that it occupies. Notice where your body connects with the floor, where your feet are touching, the chair, where your body's touching. Notice where your hands meet your legs. Notice the weight of your head on your neck and shoulders. Notice your own existence expressing through this body system. Notice your breathing the rising and the falling of your chest as you inhale and exhale. And notice your sense of being, which exists observing all of these processes, all of these manifestations. tuned to your innermost sense of being. Open your heart and open your mind. Expand your consciousness. To the infinite potential of life. Breathing in, one clean inhalation through the nostrils, using your diaphragm, filling the lungs. Exhale slowly. 
relaxing. When you're ready, you can open your eyes and we can begin. Very good. So we're here essentially for me to have the opportunity to present a book which I've written, which is called The Yogi's Way, Living in Accord with the Yamas and Niyamas. And so as part of this one hour um, session, I'll talk about the book. Um, but the objective is really to give a bit of insight into what the book is about and um, what I'm, I'm hoping to achieve in writing such a book and taking up um, this opportunity to present it to you guys. So to begin, if we're going to look at a book on which is titled The Yogi's Way, it would make sense for us just to reflect for a moment at least on what yoga is. Now, I can acknowledge that there are some people here that are very familiar in what yoga is, and but I can also acknowledge and presume that there will be those who don't. So with that, then, I'd invite you just to share in the comments um, box what you believe or what you consider or what you think yoga to be. So without writing a paragraph after paragraph, maybe in a couple of words or a line or two, you could say what you think yoga to be. And we can start with that. Very good. So I've got some comments here. Very good. Good. Okay, still a few coming in. All right, so I've got stretching. Yoga is stretching, which, to be fair, in today's world, for someone to say that yoga is stretching makes a lot of sense because we see yoga, um, how it's been marketed and presented to the world as being stretching, um, form of exercise or a way to uh, re-energize the nervous system and exercise the muscular body. We have also, it's a personal spiritual practice. So we're going from one end of the spectrum to another end of the spectrum. We talk about stretching, we're talking about the physical body. Because once we say about spiritual practice, we're going to that aspect of our uh, personal expression, which is some ways hard to measure up against the spiritual body or against the physical body. So we've got from stretching to spiritual practice, and then we tie it together, it's a way of living. And others says it's the way of living. And this is interesting because when we say it's a way of living, we have a bridge almost, which can connect the idea of stretching the body, stretching it whether physically, stretching it in term in whether physically within a formal class setting, or stretching it in terms of the challenges of living and how we go through life on a physical level and an emotional level. Um, but then we're talking about the spiritual practice, personal spiritual practice. How we live, as my teacher used to say, how we live and our capacity to live is a demonstration of our spiritual awakeness. And so it's a way of living. And then another comment is that it's union. Now, yoga is often translated to mean union simply because it, the Sanskrit word yoke it means to unite and bring together. And so it translates easily into English as um, to bring together, to unite, to union. And then we can discuss what it's union of. And we talked about their stretching in relation to the physical body. We talked about spiritual practice, that idea of spirit, which is something which is more about a quality, an essential nature, something which is beyond touch, beyond measurement. So we have one aspect of our being, which is very measurable, very quantifiable, and another aspect of our being, which is beyond both of those things. And so when we talk about union, we're talking about the unifying of those two experiences. But then we can talk about unifying in a greater depths when we talk about um, our spiritual essence and our essential nature. And we talk about it in relation to every one of us here in this um, session, in this um, workshop, uh, that each one of us has this essential nature, this spiritual aspect of our being. And so when we peel away the layers of our manifested expression, the body and the emotions and our, all the different thoughts and everything that goes on for us, 
what's the difference in our essential nature what is the what is the difference between each one of us when all those layers which help to differentiate us have been peeled away and so union works at that level too i have another um, a comment here, yoga is striving through different practices and tools to achieve self-consciousness. So again, words which are aiming to um, point at that um, method, that approach for us to be able to uh, have an understanding of our essential nature, ourselves as the quality of what we are, uh, our spirit, if you want to use that term, or as consciousness, self-consciousness, pure consciousness. So we can see yoga as being a methodology. It's a methodology which provides us with a systematic approach to be able to work through uh, the different aspects of our being, physical, which might include the stretching and the different asanas. It might include breath work to our emotional being, which again may include physical uh, asanas. It may include breathing. It may include meditation practices and just having a self-awareness of our emotional body, body and how it expresses as we move through life. And then it also um, includes our being able to understand how we relate to our minds. So yoga is a methodology, it's an approach which allows us to develop and nurture our own relationship to our physical, emotional and mental being so that we can understand that we are existing as the underlying foundation, the essence which gives rise to all of these expressions, physical, emotional, and mental. Um, and so we exist as the awareness, the pure conscious awareness, which allows for all of that expression to occur. So there's another comment which says that yoga is oneness with the all, and the all is written with a capital A. So depending on how much familiarity we have with yoga, some of how people or how people talk about yoga can seem very far removed from our own perception of yoga. So if we talk about yoga as being a stretching, and now we're talking about yoga as being oneness with everything, oneness with all, that's quite a, quite a different perspective on this concept of yoga. And just to point at that, um, the oneness with all we talked about as the second comment was it's a personal spiritual practice the ambiguity in the word spiritual is the same kind of ambiguity that we can find in oneness same kind of ambiguity we can find in the all what is oneness what is the all what is spirituality it's very easy to talk about yoga as stretching because we know what it means to perform an asana we know what it means to regulate our breathing and to be aware to some degree of a mind body um, awareness to to work on that but to talk about oneness with all now we're moving into a more subtle level of experience and expression which is harder for anybody in fact to be able to communicate in words to the extent where everybody's going to go oh yeah i know exactly what oneness with all means um, then we have another comment. Yoga for me is balance and grounding and rising. This is interesting. And so we've got grounding on one level. So I suppose it's the practical, pragmatic level of yoga where we're able to engage in life in a manner where we're able to navigate it in a way where we experience harmony and maybe uh, we experience ourselves as being able to regulate the suffering or the the challenge that life presents us with so we we yoga provides us with that grounding but it also provides rising um this capacity to see our experience of life objectively where nothing is considered personal but rather a uh, means for us to work in tandem with life as an expression of life as life itself which is working through our whole mechanism and so there's this rising, uh, this is my interpretation on the words written here. So yoga for me is the comment, yoga for me is balance and grounding and rising. So grounding, pragmatic, rising, which is helping being pragmatic because it gives us distance, it allows us to be objective on our experience. And for me then, in that comment, we can experience balance, um, a kind of a, uh, a harmony in our existence on a physical level, but then when we're internalized and 
um, disconnected from the world uh, in those moments when we're on our own, that we can feel at peace because we are able to experience that balance in how we live life. I have here, um, yoga is body active with the breathing. So it goes back to the methodology, the approach. So yoga is a methodology for us to be able to govern the different aspects of our being, physical, emotional, and mental, using processes such as asanas, which include body stretching, um, pranayama, breathing exercises, includes pratyahara and the internalization of our attention so that we can go into states of meditation and contemplate our essence. So that's the methodology. So we talk of yoga as a methodology, but then the final state, the experience that is expected to be had as a consequence of this methodology is also referred to as yoga. And so it can be considered as union, that experience which is a consequence of our application to the methodology, we facilitate ourselves to be able to experience that final goal, which is oneness, union, um, part of the whole, uh, our being without distinction, without definition, without limitation. Again, a very abstract concept to be able to just put to communicate in a manner where the penny drops and we all say, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. So yoga is a methodology which is helping us to experience reality at a level beyond our capacity to conceptualize. Um, so the last comment here that I've got is, it's a process to purify. Um, and this is a way which I commonly refer to yoga. It's a process of purification. What are we purifying? What are we purifying? The the term purification, my uh, the friend and the the brother disciple we share we have the same teacher and he often refers to the idea of purification to sound a little bit harsh a little bit um like it's a lot of um just self-denial and uh, not allowing ourselves to live and express life but the idea of purification and yoga as a process of purification is one where we except that the body and the emotional body and our mental expression, those three aspects of our being are interconnected. They're all forming and working in tandem with each other to allow us to engage with the physical, with, to engage with life as a whole in whatever manner it is manifesting. But we also have this capacity to just observe that process. But our capacity to observe is dependent on our capacity to remain attentive alert, if you want to use the word mindful or aware, our capacity to just be attuned to life as it's going on. How capable are we of doing this? Well, it depends on what our mind's doing. So our mind can be running a riot. It can be running an absolute riot. Um, and that will depend on how, well, just depends on many, many things, uh, our life experiences, what we subject ourselves to, what we choose, what we don't choose, all of these things have an influence on how our mind ends up um, working itself. And so it can run a riot. So if it's running a riot, it's very difficult for us to be attentive to the point we're able to observe. And so the process of purification is one where, which allows us to neutralize the workings of the mind, to regulate them to bring our mind, just to turn down the volume on the mind, to turn it right down. So it's down so that now the, the noise isn't occurring and we're able to just stay focused, attuned, attentive to being. So we turn down the volume going on in the mind, but we also exist as an emotional person, as a physical person. And there's stuff going on at those levels of existence too, which cause a lot of noise. Um, emotions are a natural process, but how we identify with them can influence um, how much noise we experience. On a physical level, we can experience symptoms, physical symptoms, which can demand our attention, cause us to um, be unable to experience a degree of peace or a degree of comfort so that we are able to even stay focused or attentive. The demands of the body are such that we are not able to appreciate that 
the capacity to tune attune ourselves to life is going to actually help and support us rather we limit ourselves to the physical body and we make it the the uh, i suppose in in certain words we make it the most important thing about living as opposed to life itself and so the different aspects um, that we may experience on our physical body the different conditions um they demand our attention so if our, our physical body is demanding our attention whatever regard if it's being over concerned about our physical uh, shape or getting old or maybe uh, an ailment which we are just letting to run on and run on, run on and run on all of these things if our attention is being absorbed and focusing on our physical body then we can't have the capacity to free up our attention so it's expansive so it's not being limited so pro yoga is the process of purification which leads to the final results the final experience of experiencing being a purified sense of being okay i've gone into a lot of detail on what yoga is i think it merits doing so because this book that i've written the yogi's way is based on two of the eight limbs of yoga so when we talk about yoga as a methodology there is eight steps within that methodology none of the steps is more important than the other each one complements the other it's not like a staircase each one is um working in tandem with the other the final step is the state of absorption union and so in some regard that can be considered uh, um, a very key step however we are at this point in our expression in our existence living a life which is engaging with the world and we're also a living a life or we're existing at a level which is subtle and which is not needing to engage with anything but so long as we are engaging with the world and so long as this is our expression then all of the limbs are significant because we're we're learning to understand our mental emotional and physical bodies so the yamas and niyamas are the first two steps in this methodology and they're ones which sometimes can be overlooked by uh, practitioners of yoga because there's a focus on wanting to get good at meditation wanting to be able to experience trans states where there's this experience which, which is very subtle very internalized very disconnected from the world it has its place and it's um, of great benefit however the first two limbs and the limbs uh, of the yamas and niyamas on which the book is based they provide us with a means to be able to engage with life in a manner where we are letting go of our identification with our limited sense of of what we are so we talked about the physical body by over identifying with the physical body we can limit ourselves and we can bring about suffering growing old is a perfect example when we see the body's aging and we and we see that this transformation taking place we can identify with that ident with that transformation but do so in a negative way where we want to hold on to how we were and not move into how where we're going and so the process of life and the expression of life itself becomes something that we're resisting and in that resistance we bring around our own suffering and so the yamas and niyamas are a framework for us to be able to reflect on how we are we are going against the flow of life how we're just resisting life and how that is causing an impurity within us and so by adhering to the yamas and yamas niyamas we are allowing ourselves to reflect so that we can let go of those things that we cling on to those things that we identify with to the point that we are then able to be free of what is considered or often called bondage and uh, that that being tied up in the identifications of what we think we are or how we think things should be and how we think um, life ought to work and all these things which are part of our imagination part of our mental constructs which we're imposing on life but they're not life 
And so the yamas and niyamas remind us that life is life. It's doing its thing. And we are an aspect of life. And what's moving through us, this capacity to be aware of this whole process, is what we should focus on. Focus on the capacity to be aware of what's taking place rather than identifying with ourselves as the, which is essentially the puppet being moved around, that we are identifying with our capacity to observe what is um, going on, what is being expressed by life itself. Now, I've spoken a bit on yoga and what the yamas and niyamas are. My reason for writing the book was because I myself spent a lot of time involved in meditation practice. I had a teacher in the tradition of Kriya Yoga, and uh, I received from him instruction um, from several years. Um, and then I went on to teach yoga, specifically meditation and contemplative practice practices as they are taught in the Kriya Yoga tradition. Um, but it wasn't until quite late in my own practice that I realized that there was a lot of who I was as an individual expressing within this world, which I hid from myself and I wasn't able to appreciate as being something that needed to be looked at. And as a consequence of that, uh, I can now see in hindsight that my own meditation practice was being held back. I can see that my own capacity to um, engage in life, which was far more harmonious, was restricted. And so I took it on board. I took it on myself to just, I looked at the Amazon. I looked at yoga as a system and I looked at, okay, I'm, I think I'm quite good at meditation. I think I'm quite good at moving to those subtle states of internalization and being able to contemplate. But there's something holding me back from all of this. And there's something holding me back from just feeling comfortable with who I am when I'm engaged in life, because I have one world, which is my internalized world, which I feel like I'm making good headway with. I'm able to go into those peaceful states. But when I come out of it and I engage in life, it feels like the storm, I'm just not able to contend with it. It's a uh, life, even though it might not be too demanding, there's aspects of it which just push my buttons a little too easily. What's going on here? I thought yoga was supposed to facilitate my purified, being purified and facilitate my being able to just be at one with life, union with life. And so I looked at what does yoga offer? Uh, you know, the practice is very good and everything, but what does it offer that's going to help me with life? And it was right there, you know, the first two principles, the yamas and niyamas. That's what they say. This is the two uh, preceding and um, fundamental uh, factors to building a foundation in yoga practice is the yamas and niyamas. So I looked at them. And I prioritized them over my meditation practice. I continued my meditation practice, but I gave them priority, as in um, I, I, I wanted to understand them. And so I went through a process, a rigorous process of self-reflection. And it went on for over a year of journaling, journaling. Like uh, the book here is 363 pages. I equally wrote the same amount in my journaling, if not more. Um, but it wasn't just the writing, because I've done writing before and I've done writing in my past. I had journaled, but it was more trying to understand the yamas and niyamas, not just as terms. In so far as we talk about yoga being a term, what does it mean? Or we talk about oneness as a term, what does it mean? The yamas and niyamas are made up with words which are translated into English as uh, nonviolence, um, truthfulness, non stealing. Um, and then there's the term brahmacharya, which can be translated by different teachers in different ways, a parigraha, non-attachment. So these terms, they're terms. But I was really intent on understanding what do they actually mean beyond just my projected perception of what they mean. And so I went through this process. And as a consequence of doing it, I found that I experienced a good deal of insight. I, what I mean by that is that it helped purify my expression or my understanding of how I expressed in the physical world and how um, I expressed on an emotional level and indeed just the nature of the mind, which is essentially made up of constructs and concepts and imaginations or imaginings. 
So here I was using the Amas and Niyamas to understand just how I make up these constructs and imaginings and, and concepts and to look into them in a very deep level. So I wrote the book with the motivated to be able to share this experience with other people. And the book is titled The Yogi's Way. And obviously, if you're into yoga, it'll mean more to you if it says the word yogi on it. Um, there's a book that was titled uh, The Artist's Way years ago. Um, it's still quite popular, I believe. But if you're an artist, you'll pick up the book because it says The Artist's Way. And so The Yogi's Way, I can imagine that if you're into yoga and it's something that you practice, you're more inclined to pick up the book. But that said, the practice or the framework of the yamas and niyamas is one which, if it's applied by anybody, will give results. And it's the same with the book. I, I wouldn't limit it to people who are practitioners of yoga. It's a book which requires um, personal involvement. It requires personal reflection. It requires a great deal of self-honesty, brutally, being brutally self-honest with yourself. Um, but the book facilitates each and every reader as they come to it. And the reason I say that is because, it, like even here, we're part of this session, we're sharing the space and we're talking about yoga and you're listening to me talk about yoga. I've been involved in yoga for over 20 years. Some of you may be more familiar or less familiar with yoga. And so we all come with different degrees of understanding or uh, insight or experience. And so I, the book, I, when I put it together, after having done my own process, when I was putting the book together and trying to navigate how would be the best way to present this to people um, so it wouldn't close anybody off, um, I, I, I realized that the process I use myself had actually been one which got progressively deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper because I wanted to go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And so if somebody picks up the book and they start with the process which is being invited or which is being shared, um, and when they pick up the book, it's it, it works in a manner where the first couple of weeks, the first couple of sequences will be lighter, let's say, than when you get towards the end of the book. So the book is the, has been put together in a way where it allows for a progressively deeper reflection with the understanding that the individual using the book is going to experience a progressively deeper insight and bring about their own natural transformation. Now, the layout of the book is, it's broken down into sequences. Um, there's different sequences and each sequence is made up of an average depends on the sequence but to give a general overview the sequences are made up of 10 weeks so one sequence has 10 weeks and those 10 weeks one week is given to each of the yamas and niyamas so there are in total 10 yamas and niyamas so one sequence 10 weeks one week to each of the yamas and niyamas um, what I might do is I might just share with you uh, what actually takes place in the sequences. So at the beginning of the book, when things are starting off a little bit lighter, there's a reading text and then there's writing exercises. There's a personal reflection and then there's supplementary activity. And then um, the idea is that the reading text will be supportive and part of daily practice, the writing exercise a specific exercise will be done every day for that week um, as part of the um, personal reflection, but also the reader will be required to keep a journal and to do a personal reflection. And then there will be a supplementary practice which calls on the reader to, at some point during the week, to sit down and apply themselves to this practice. So that goes on for the first section of the book. But then as things move in, we're, we're moving away from just exploring concepts to now moving them into our experience of life. So the first section of the book, there's a lot of trying to unearth and dig deep into our understanding of specific concepts and how we engage in life from as a kind of looking in the mirror kind of thing. But in the second half of the book, it, there's reading texts again. So there's one sequence and each sequence has uh, one week dedicated to each of the yamas and niyamas and so there's a reading text then there's a life practice 
And so there's a specific practice which is explained and which the readers expected to apply themselves to as they um, engage in life. So now we're moving away from just looking in the mirror and trying to understand what was going on in ourselves. We're actually applying ourselves to life and then measuring how well we're doing. So then there's a reflection exercise and there's a writing exercise. And then there's a supplementary exercise again, um, something which is to be done that week to add to the practice. Now, I've designed the book for individuals who are um, yoga enthusiasts, yoga um, people who find have or feel they have found their means to understanding who they are and their how they relate to life through yoga. That said, uh, the book is easily accessible by anybody who has no idea what yoga is. There's no real um, pressure on anyone to understand or to have a preliminary understanding of foundational concepts or anything like that. The book is aimed at helping individuals to live life practically. As my teacher used to say, the demonstration of um, spiritual maturity or spiritual awakening um, is revealed on how well somebody's able to live life. And that doesn't mean that they have billions of dollars or euros or great cars or great houses. It means that they're able to demonstrate their own beingness as being in tune with life on a, in, through their different experiences. Now, we all know that we have buttons. We all know that we have internal workings, unconscious processes that we're not familiar with that can trigger us and get things going in ways that we find difficult or at least challenging to get our head around. This book is a, in its own way, a process of analysis. In so much as sitting in meditation practice, we are invited to contemplate our true nature. What we're actually doing is invite, we're getting ourselves into a place where we are trying to understand the nature of our mind and how we relate to it and break or manage that relationship to the point where we're able to turn the volume right down and experience just being. What the book is aiming to do is to say, okay, you've got these concepts, the yamas and niyamas, there's 10 of them. You think you know what they are because they are all said in these individual words and the words look different. Truth is very different to non-attachment. You know, there's, there's specific meanings which we can assign to each one. But if we work with them and really work with them, what ends up happening is that the boundaries between non-violence, truthfulness, non-stealing, non-attachment, living in truth or living with God or living with life, um, purity, um, uh, self-contentment, all of these things, they end up just, the words themselves are not important. What's important is the experience of having each one of those. And so the boundaries of the terminology, that the boundaries imposed by terminology or the boundaries imposed by conceptual imaginings and understandings, it gets dissolved because our relationship practically through our living and reflecting and measuring and through our documenting and writing and meditating and all of these things, it's the, the boundaries between each one of these concepts dissolves and we experience our own capacity to be attentive, attentive to life, meaning aware, or if you want to use the word mindful, and we're engaging in life. Now it's not so much as am I being truthful or not truthful? Am I stealing or not stealing? That might be there. The question might be there, but it's more about the experience of oneness. And so it starts to reveal itself. And so I am um, I'm inclined to call the Yamas and Niyamas um, synonyms, like each one of the words it acts as a cinnamon for the, for the word yoga. So when we say yoga, it's a concept of oneness. What, what's the best way to communicate oneness? It means being truthful. It means being nonviolent. It means being not stealing, having non-attachment, being contentment. This is oneness. And so the, the terms and the concepts which are outlined in the yamas and niyamas are a framework for us to be able to quantify our experience of life. But as we use the framework, this, this kind of constructed map starts to just dissolve in itself and the experience of the reality, it becomes more prominent. 
okay so our we have a tendency to measure our life with um our own words putting our thoughts into words and verbalizing things and putting our opinion on it and using our own concepts and imaginings and different things and then in that way we box off our experiences and we put it all in a very kind of consciously comfortable way but we know that there's a lot more going on and it's not always comfortable and so this framework helps us to just we project we, we just place it over our experience of life if you can imagine doing this you you put the framework over your experience of life you come home every day you engage with the book you engage with your process of journaling using the book and then as a consequence the 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 framework itself helps you to see the the territory the the reality that's happening beyond it um, and as you continue with the book as you continue with the process and indeed without the book if you just use the yamas and niyamas in a very uh, sincere committed manner this this there's a, a capacity to just appreciate what's going on in reality as opposed to what's going on in our imagination now I've talked a good deal um, and hopefully what I've said has served in helping to outline what the book is and its objective um, I had imagined or not imagined I had planned on reading um, some things from the book which I might do but I think just given the time and given how things are going I might just invite some questions so if anybody has anything that they'd like to ask based on if you've already had the opportunity to see the book and you'd like to ask something it's fine or if you just something comes to mind now that's fine but if you have a question just type it into the comments section it just makes things easier to keep it um, visual for me thank you very much if you have any questions feel free to type them in now um got one did the process of writing the book teach you more about your own practice yes in a simple answer yes it absolutely did my own practice as I kind of I, I mentioned a little bit was very it was very much about understanding the meditative process understanding meditation applying myself to meditation and then just um being getting good at that expecting for my expecting to have some kind of amazing transformative experience that would just make the whole thing worthwhile and then the it would prove what yoga is all about and the process by going through the process before writing the book it taught me that um it's it is a process and it's it's one where the revelation is very subtle and it absolutely requires our ability to let go it's all about letting go the whole thing is about letting go and I know I've heard teachers talk about this and I've probably said it myself in other seminars and but through this process um I re it really just taught me that the whole thing is about letting go and surrendering um and with the concept such as non-violence you hear of non-violence you have a perception oh well I'm not violent or I'm kind of violent or I do that I do this but there's a demand put in you to just let go of all the different ideas and notions and perceptions and the the kind of uh, the kind of feeling of well the identifications that you have yourself with this idea of being non-violent just letting go of the whole thing to just burst the bubble um so that the so that the experience of each of the concepts such as non-violence just starts to get more subtle more and more subtle um so I hope that answered that question I have another question what do pure and unpure mean in this framework yeah so this this question because the, as my I said my friend uh, Ryan Kirksack he he talk about this process of purification it doesn't always sound so appealing and then the idea of pure and unpure essentially there is no such thing as unpurity or impurity um what 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 there is a reality of is having a veil over our perception of who we are 
to the point where we are disconnected from appreciating, understanding and being one with life. We're still existing in life. It's still going on. We're still, but we just can't see the wood from the trees. We, we see life as something that's going on and us as being something in relation to life, but actually we are life. And so the idea of pure and unpure, it's again, they're just words. But when we talk about the process of purification, we're talking about the process of removing the veil, which is getting in the way of our being able to see ourselves as life, as the vehicle for creation to exp to express. And then what we what are we then if we're if if life, if we are life, then what's the body then? What is this emotional experience? What is the mind? They are, these are all just aspects of life itself. What we are is the capacity to be consciously aware of it. Um, and so to the degree that we're able to be consciously aware of it or not, is to the degree that we, we could call ourselves pure or impure. But I'm not using the, that terminology. I'm not talking about somebody being pure or impure. I'm just talking about the process as being one of, I suppose, I call it a process of purification. You might call it a process of letting go or a process of just clearing away the cloud or whatever terminology you want to use. But it's a process of just realizing that there's been something blocking you from being able to just perceive reality as it is. Um, what do you mean when you said you hid yourself? Hid from yourself. Can you elaborate? Yeah. Hiding from yourself. It's an, it's, it's an interesting one <clears throat> because I suppose we all do it. Um, and I'm only, I'm only able to talk about it in hindsight because at the time, obviously, I didn't feel like I was hiding from myself. Um, I felt like I was doing the practice as rigorously and as, um, as meaningfully and as um, honestly as I, as I was. But now when I look back in hindsight, I can see, well, actually you know, I had patterns of behavior. I had patterns or ways of thinking, which were in a cycle or repetitive, um, things that were going on that now I can appreciate. I've kind of pulled the linchpin, you know, I've pulled them apart. But it's interesting to look back and see they were kind of ongoing. So even though I was doing my practice, even though I was very, very intensely involved with my formal meditation practice and the other formal practices, that had been taught to me within the Kriya Yoga tradition. It was just, I was able to be kind of blind to what needed to be done to break those patterns of behavior or those not serving thought processes. Um, to elaborate more, I, I suppose I'd say that the every you know the fruit ripens in its own time so i don't fault myself i don't fault myself for not being able to see but i i do see how an adherence to the yamas and niyamas the framework on this offered in the book and true yoga not necessarily this book but the framework offered in yoga of the yamas and niyamas is definitely one for the yoga practitioner, helps them to find the balance, which is essential for them to be able to really know who they are in, in how they experience themselves engaging in life. Not who they are as the pure conscious awareness, which is, um, which is um, observing all that's taking place. That will happen too, but also just to know themselves in terms of who they are engaging in life like this is where it gets a little bit uh, i suppose uh, abstract because so we talk about the self and we talk about the that aspect of you which is able to observe everything you do um the body can do so many things the functions of the body happen all the time and i don't need to pay attention to them they will happen but if i want i can observe them i can be attentive to them um i have that capacity and life is doing stuff all the time. It's all taking place. If I want, I can identify with my own imagination and all the workings of my mind, or I can just, I, I can just I'd be attentive to what life is doing. And so there's this choice. Um, and in our meditation practice, we're trying to just choose to attune ourselves to just being and that process of just being and just be with that and observe that. When we're not meditating, um, 
it's the same thing. It's the process of just being, but we're experiencing that just being through life. It's taking place. It's in a manifested form. Um, so, yeah, the hiding from myself is it was everything is in good timing um, uh, as a consequence of being through this process. I'm sharing this book. Um, I feel that looking back, I could have taken the yamas and niyamas more seriously. <laughs> you know, if, if if my future self was to talk to my past self, it would be, I think you could have paid a bit more attention to them. But I didn't, and there's no, there's no harm there. It's all fine. But it's my motivation for sharing this now with you guys. Another question. You mentioned a teacher who discussed how the ability to live life practically shows our attunement to life as it is. Are there any books I can read about this teacher? Okay, so this teacher was Roy Eugene Davis. Roy Eugene Davis was a direct disciple of Paramahansa Yogananda, who wrote the book um, Autobiography of a Yogi. Roy was a very dedicated teacher and practitioner. He taught yoga and the principles of Kriya Yoga for close on 70 years. So that's you know, 70 years. So, it's, you know, even just to conceive that, um, he was very dedicated. And he's written a great deal, uh, a great many books. Um, the books I would probably recommend for, from Roy straight off, if you're new to Roy's teachings, would be his book um, um, on the Yoga Sutras, uh, Self-Realization. Um, so if you put into Amazon, Roy Eugene Davis, the Yoga Sutras, you'll find his book. Um, yeah, he, he has passed, um, and the Center for Spiritual Awareness, which he founded, um, it, it still publishes his books, so you could contact them to Center for Spiritual Awareness, and they would recommend some of his books too. Um, the book on the Yoga Sutras is called The Science of Self-Realization. The Science of Self-Realization. Um, so that's a good start. Uh, do you think that your book can be a good way to bring people to the practice of yoga? I think this is, uh, I'd like, you're welcome. Yeah. Um, in regards to the question, do I think it's a good way to bring people to the practice of yoga? I like to think so. You know, um, I think that something can happen within men in all disciplines. Sometimes there can be an us and them thing that happens. And I think that yoga right now is is in a position to reveal itself as being the holistic, integrative um, discipline that it is. It includes body work, it includes br uh, breathing, it includes um, having mind, body awareness, it includes um, auto or self-analysis, it includes so many of the different disciplines or practices which nowadays have become mainstream. Um, often it's limited to just being asanas and a form of it, uh, of exercise, but I but yoga I feel right now is very much able to just demonstrate its full worth, and obviously not everybody will want to dive in there and take it up, but I feel with a book like this, despite the title, <laughs> which is very much aimed at. Uh, those committed already committed to yoga, I think that uh, by reading it and going through it, there'd be a, a capacity to relate to yoga in practical terms, um, where the 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 ability to live life with a more enhanced understanding of who you are and what life is would be revealed, and then as a consequence, maybe the other more formal practices would be taken up. But I, in fact, if I'm to reveal some of the secret, I encourage um, meditation as part of this book. There are, at the back of the book, I'm going to show you here, there's QR codes to different um, practices, different um, reflection practices and meditation practices. And they're, they're offered in tandem with the different um, sequences. So we talked about the sequences and each sequences um, relate to each of the yamas and niyamas. And then when you get in certain, some of the sequences, they offer a QR code and in the QR code, obviously you scan it and it'll bring you through to uh, practice. One which is in some ways, it's just internalizing and just reflecting, 
but in some of them it's an actual meditation um and although meditation isn't being taught formally within this book it encourages the the reader to kind of get used to um having a space to build their relationship and how they understand their internal processes the mind and their relationship to it um I have another one here, another question. How did you break out of those patterns eventually? I understand you said through focusing on yamas and niyamas and self-reflection through journaling, but could you give an example perhaps? Once we become aware of a pattern or a repetitive thought cycle, which isn't healthy, how do we work through it? This is it. So this is where the truth part comes in. So we become aware of it, but we don't become aware of it. We become aware of it, but yeah we kind of what's the term used these days greenwash it we maybe we ego wash it <laughs> so we become aware of something within ourselves but we come up with a good ways to to paint it in a light where it's not all bad or paint it in a light where actually it's okay or painted in a light. We just have ways of working with these things. We're, we're incredible at this. And what's actually doing it is the mind. It's our imagination, which is coming up with a means to put a different slant on what we're experiencing. Because by putting on a different slant in it, the ego's happier. So when we talk about reality and being able to just experience reality, that's what's going on all the time. Life presents something, we see it, we put a slant in it, then our ego goes, cool, I got it, I'm fine with that. But if you present it the way life is presenting it, it might not always be comfortable. So sometimes we see stuff in ourselves, and I saw stuff in myself. I can't give you an outright example um, because I've disconnected from it. I've disidentified from some of those things. There are probably core things, but it's not something I'm inclined to share just because, you know, our own internal processes are our own for a reason. Um, so... But there are, and you'll be able to understand this yourself. There's moments when you you realize something in yourself, you have an awareness in it, and then it happens again. And then it happens again. And you kind of wonder, well, why does this keep on happening? How come I can't change it? And I don't think that there's a light bulb switch. I don't think there's a light switch where you can just go on, off, and it's just gone. I don't think that's possible. And maybe there's others who can offer that, but I, I'm not proposing that, and I don't think it's possible. But I think that... Thank you. You... Sorry. So just on the point that you're mentioning, how does the the framework of the yamas and niyamas is basically going to work in a way where when you're dealing with the behaviors or the, the those things that you've become aware of within yourself, the framework is so um, systematic or it's so consistent in how it's being presented that it limits you in being able to um, come up with imagined uh, answers or solutions rather you have to just be honest and uh, work deeper into it and as I said the book works deeper and deeper and deeper so if at the start of the book you notice something relating to stealing let's say and you're you're kind of working through it and you get a glimpse of it but as you continue with the book and you, you're 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 going to have to go back to stealing again and you're going to have to go back to stealing 18 times so it's going to get a little bit more exposed and a little bit more exposed and more exposed and you're really working with it and so i can't say that the book is going to uh, sort sort you know sort out all those little personal issues that we have for everybody but it's definitely um i found and i feel it will provide a, a meaningful structure that will have benefit in whatever guise or whatever way I can't predict, but I'm sure it will have some benefit. Um, I'll move on to the next question. Hi, David. I know I've gone over time a little bit. Um, so I'll, I'll just take this as the last question. Um, hi, David. How was your experience when you started to go deeper in this way of living and thinking? I sometimes feel that the more you become aware of who you are, the more you feel in conflict in this world. Okay, good. And it can become harder to be understood by people who are not aware of this way or living or thinking. This is it. This is the essence of it. So I can understand this because I was intensely involved with yoga practice. It was my personal practice. I didn't really talk to people about it for probably 10 years. I talked to the people who we shared the same teacher. I talked to them about it, but I didn't talk to my social circles or people I worked with about my practice. I kept it to myself. And... I also 
found myself um, being very committed to the meditation processes, the formal processes, the formal teachings and applying all them. And I was very committed to it. And I did my utmost to adhere to these routines. But all the while, I was, I was shortchanging myself because I wasn't um, being uh, true to my own nature, which is to be sociable and to connect with people. Uh, my own nature, which is to want to live and to express in life and to do different things. I am. Um, it's not to say I wasn't living. I was working. I had a job, and you know, I had friends and relationships and different things, but. I compartmentalized yoga in such a way that it became kind of like my go-to to feel like I was perfect and I had a control and I was in charge and everything was worked out. And it was, it was a very safe space for me. And then obviously when I leave that space and I go back into the world, I don't have the same control or I didn't when well, I still don't have <laughs> the same control. I don't have um, the capacity to, in the same way as meditation practice, I have the process, I work with it, I'm my own boss, I'm, you know, even though the mind's reckless and it does whatever, it's my space. But when you go into the world, there's so much going on. And it's very easy then to walk out of that space where you feel like the formal space where your meditation practice and walk into the world and find the world to be altogether wrong and everything in the world wrong and the people doing things wrong and how they're not into yoga and they need to do this and do that and do that. If I'm going to put it in a nutshell, that's what the yamas and niyamas are for. They're there to kind of bridge that idea that we are um, somewhere out there and that all of this is just, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, um, just a nuisance. You know, okay, fair enough. Um, yoga teaching does get into the idea of illusion and um, how reality is, uh, you know, it's misperception. It talks about our true essence as being eternal and not being held by the definitions of the body and the mind. And then all of this we can explore and we can explore it in our formal practice. But in terms of actually just being able to live life, because if we think about it, the idea of being this essence, this quality, this, this being, which is not being defined by the color of our hair or not being defined by the kind of job we do or not being defined by our past history or not being defined by the kind of people we hang around with, this beingness, which is just being, just being. That beingness is the same in our meditation practice as it is when we're engaging in life. The thing that happens when we're engaging in life is we don't identify with that beingness as easily because there's all this stuff going on. So what do we identify with? We identify with what's going on in the mind. We identify with all the turbulent emotions. We replay emotions. We rehash them. We create more thought processes. We identify with the body and how it responds to it. We identify with all that stuff. And so we're the same as everybody else. We're the same as everybody, even though they might not be doing yoga or they, they're having the same experience where they have all this stuff they're identifying with, which stops them from being able to experience peace. And so in our meditation practice, we can feel like, and I felt like I was getting very good because I could experience very extreme states of peace and clarity in my meditation practice, come out into informal, what happened? And so I started to, criticize the world and blame the world and all you know and other people and all this kind of stuff but that's where yoga is saying that but it's not about some fantastic other world out there this is the reality this is the reality and the reality is only going to be uh, as you are able to be with it once it's your reality of your mind and the reality of all your constructs that's not the reality. That's your world. And in your world, your own individualized, personalized, um, custom created world, there's going to be lots of things which you deem right or wrong or in, you know, all these different labels that we can put on things. But when we when we just manage to kind of disconnect ourselves from that imagined construct of, of life and what's going on, 
we I, we can just experience it so when we meet somebody who isn't on yoga path and they're talking stuff and maybe they seem very confused or they're speaking in a manner which is we can we can because we're going through the same thing ourselves we can sympathize with them empathize with them um you know maybe there'd be an opportunity to say something which is comforting supporting but the idea isn't that we're to change everything the idea is that we're able to just be it like be life life is expressing it's going on it's doing everything we're not doing it we we are observing it it's just doing itself it's going on we're observing it um and so then when it comes to our inter engagement with it where we're making choices and we're 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 kind of guiding this vehicle this expression of life but we have this capacity to a bit like our breathing it's happening all the time but sometimes we can say i'm going to regulate it now and i'm going to breathe in this way with life we're endeavoring to just be with it just let it flow and then sometimes we have the opportunity to make decisions and choose which way to go and in those moments we are going to be better able to do that the more we can just appreciate what's going on rather than attune, like identifying with what we think should be going on or our perception of what's going on. So it's just basically being as purified as we can to be able to just receive what's going on. So I hope that answers that question for you to some degree. Um, very good, guys. Thank you for all your questions. There was quite a lot of questions, um, and I appreciate that. It's um, it's it's interesting to just receive questions because it it allows me to um, have an idea of what people are experiencing. You know, I've experienced it, and I, I've ex I'm still experiencing it. But we're all kind of in our own. Um, well we're all experiencing it from our own ego perspective so it's uh it's different um okay so at this point what i might do is just i had planned to read some things from the book as i had mentioned um i'm going to read one thing from the book i have a uh, something marked i'll read it now um just to give you an idea of what is in this so this is on Svadhyaya, which is the practice of um, self-study. So it says, study is dependent on being able to focus and concentrate. When we go about any kind of study, we must remain sufficiently alert and attentive. Firstly, to accurately perceive the information being studied. And secondly, to commit to it to memory or acquire new learnings. If distracted, the entire practice of study becomes ineffective. The study of the self is no different. It requires focus and concentration. This can be achieved through formal meditation practices, where the objective is to remain anchored in one-pointed, focused concentration. In our day-to-day -day lives, the practice of remaining alert and attentive as we engage with life in every moment is referred to as self-awareness, or mindfulness. Self-awareness is fundamental to the practice of self-study. Self-study is the study of one's essential nature, which exists independent of identification with any aspect of manifested reality. It is not simply the observation of one's individual personality traits or characteristics. Self-awareness is the cultivation of awareness of one's essential nature. For clarity, Self with a lowercase s is used to refer to one's individual ego personality, and self with an uppercase s is used to refer to our innermost being as unconditioned conscious awareness. In order to be able to study the innermost self, we must be able to remain aware of it. This is not an intellectual process. It is the capacity to observe what is occurring in the created world without becoming entangled in it. These occurrences may be gross or they may be subtle. They may be external or internal. They include rising emotional responses and the movements of the mind. Self-awareness is the practice of remaining inwardly still and calm, poised in a position of objective observation, simply witnessing all that is taking place. As we develop our skill in the practice of self-awareness, we're able to practice self-study. 
Firstly, perceiving reality as it occurs. And secondly, recognizing our true relationship to it. Okay. What I might do is just before we finish, just to be able to leave in this in a headspace, which is um, uh, to give ourselves the chance just to receive everything and to let it process a little bit before we just end the session. And we'll just do a little guided meditation practice, okay? Just for five minutes. Um, and towards the end of the practice, I'll um, read an excerpt from the book and then we'll finish with that, okay? So just to say thank you, um, and thank, I'm receiving comments here. You're all very welcome. It's my it's my privilege and um, a pleasure to be able to offer this back to you. Um, so thank you. So we'll do a meditation practice just for five minutes. And as I said, I'll just uh, read out uh, an excerpt from the book towards the end. Okay. So if you just want to find a comfortable position. Okay, so sitting upright. Breathing in deeply, filling your lungs. Exhale slowly, relaxing. Bring your attention to your heart center that space in the center of your chest. And allow your attention to become condensed, concentrating inward at this point. Allow your attention to become more and more absorbed in your heart center drawing itself inward to your heart as you exhale. On each exhalation for the next several exhalations, feel your attention diving deeper and deeper into your heart center. Drawing your attention deep within. And abide in this space, a space free of definition, free of limitation, free of boundary, free of constructs. And in this space, remaining attentive, I read to you, who am I? What am I? What is the purpose of this life? How effective am I at living it? How can I live with greater meaning and purpose? How can I be in order to express for the greater good of creation? What can I do to enhance my unhindered intuitive expression? What can I do to flow with life with greater harmony, peace, joy, and fulfillment? What is stopping me? What is holding me back? How is my perception influenced by the way I think, the things I say, and the things I do? What beliefs get in my way? How easy is it for me to let go? What are the values I wish to live by? What are the qualities I see as being most virtuous? How do I imagine one who is awake, going about their day-to-day -day lives? And what does it mean to be awake? What does it mean to liberate your consciousness? How does adhering to the five yamas and niyamas serve me, those around me, and life as a whole? Who am I asking these questions of? Who has the answers? Who am I?
And now allowing your attention to expand outward from your heart center, filling your body, expanding outside the limits of your body, filling the room you're sitting in, expanding outside the room that you're sitting in, to the space around you, the community that you're living in, and the greater, wider world. Feel yourself open to the infinite, infinite potential of life. Take one deep breath, filling your lungs. Exhale slowly, relaxing. Prepared to return to your day. Thank you all very much, guys. I'm going to end the session. Take care. Bye-bye.